。哎，妈妈。哎，我爱你。I have been on the internet since 2003, which is around the time some of my viewers were born, and that terrifies me to no end. Obviously, before I understood the concept of modern fandom, I draw fan art of my favorite characters because, well, that's what I did for the things I love. I have fond memories of pouring hours over a one-to-one -one copy of Wind Waker Zelda, or really, really bad Kingdom Hearts fan art that my mom has thankfully thrown out. Of course, this meant I also drew my fictional crushes. Um, Piccolo from DB. Z 2003 TMNT Leonardo, and I realized that there is a trend going on here. Now, jump to 2007, during the peak of Live Journal and DeviantArt, I discovered there were other people out there who based the crux of their mental sanity on people who don't exist, and one of their expressions of love for these characters involved the practice of shipping, the fandom activity of pairing off characters into romantic relationships. It's a form of love, fan art, and fan fiction being common offerings. Because what is a better gift for someone you love? Than love itself, and normally this would entail pairing off characters within the same body of work. But what if you want characters? From different worlds to hook up, or perhaps the ship involves two characters from the same show who never met. But there's something for the audience to latch onto. That's when we start to delve into the territory of crack ships. Like it's been known that shippers will latch onto any two attractive characters that happen to share the same room. The court of shipping deems it mandatory to ship them faster than two-day Amazon Prime shipping. But sometimes the game gets a little complicated, and people get paired up because of similar aesthetics ranging from color palette to powers. For this, I present to you. You, Jack Frost and Elsa, two characters from Rise of the Guardians and Frozen. But sometimes people don't even need that much of a reason to want to see two people together, and the mere existence of potential chemistry is enough to break the boundaries between universes. Think Merida from Brave and Rapunzel from Tangled, or um, Jack Frost from Rise of the Guardians and Hiccup from How to Train Your Dragon. And Jack Frost is working overtime. Combined, they form the fandom Rise of the Brave Tangled Dragons, an internet oddity that cannot be comprehended by human eyes, and yet was somehow enthralling enough to cultivate a fandom that endures. To this day, and these are the more mainstream or wholesome crack ships. Tumblr gave me once their self sass. Sure, okay, I'm stronger for it. DeviantArt forced Mordecai and Twilight Sparkle down my throat. All right, I'll swallow to make things easier. Needless to say, I am like a World War II vet who has witnessed the horrors of early internet fandom before it got its feet firmly planted on the ground in the current meta. And yet, I was never prepared for what TikTok would cook up next. I think I'm trapped in the prison realm too. And yet. Gojo Satoru is nowhere to be found. Times are tough. Hi, I'm Vicky. And if you don't know what a crack ship is, it's not much different from fentanyl pairings. As defined by Urban Dictionary, a crack ship is an unusual relationship of any kind of fandom, i.e., books, shows, movies, etc. That is unlikely to happen. The crack part refers to how you have to be clearly intoxicated to some extent to support such a relationship. The unlikeliness of it happening can be twisted to any definition. If both people in the relationship have never had an interaction, that could be considered a crack ship. However, this shouldn't be confused with a rare pair. That is well, a rare ship, an unpopular ship. Although I would dare say the two can overlap depending on the situation. At the core of crack ships is the desire to cause chaos to sow confusion, and it requires more explanation than understanding. To get a better idea, let's take a look at Crack Ships Daily, a Tumblr blog that does exactly what it says it does. Every day, the blog will post a crack ship of the day. Let's take a look at their most recent post. Huh? Ah, I don't understand, but that's part of the charm, I guess. I like to define the appeal of shipping as an extension of pretend play, like when kids played with dolls. We visualize fantasy scenarios that we act out through fictional characters, our little coffee shop AUs, our little rivals to lovers shenanigans, our dreams of renting a one-bedroom apartment with floor-to-ceiling windows with ample sunlight and plenty of plants. Crack ships are like the not-so-wholesome version of a tiger and a dog becoming friends, an unlikely pair that would make no sense under natural circumstances, but one that we. Accept with caution and baited interest. Crack ships are the fandom version of dipping French fries in milkshakes. Heresy. <laughs> I would say I'm completely kidding, but breaking the laws of characters' unique universes just so you can smash them together like a couple of GI Joes isn't exactly kosher to multiverse law. If traditional shipping was the wistful, romantic daydreaming of a girl dressed in soft linen under an evergreen tree, crack shipping was the cousin who eats chocolate dipped in antifreeze. And the beauty of crack shipping was that once you get over the initial shock, you can get in on the joke and share in the madness. Whether it's in the form of fan art, memes, or dedicated crack ship charts on DeviantArt, you can get in on the fun too and stun people like as if you're speaking a whole other language.
that. It's why I believe the ethos of crack shipping is irony, making it an objective fact that crack ships are not meant to be enjoyed sincerely, much like memes. In the case of Merida Rapunzel or Jack Frost and Hiccup, however, a crack ship can be born from an ardent passion to see two people together rather than being just a joke. It's just that the humor is more of an incidental side effect that comes from the surprise of seeing two unlikely characters, rather than being the primary reason to ship these characters. And everything's fun and good, people are sharing their AMVs, their edits, their meta threads, their fan art, and whether or not it is with great sincerity or irony is vague at times. Crack Ships Daily keeps churning out ships that could only be procedurally generated, but we scratch our heads before we let out a hearty laugh. But something emerges within the reverie its gate punctuated by the shine of a crystal heel clicking along the marble, the sheen of a red eye ghosting over yours in a flash. Vaguely, you make out the visage of a couple, an odd pair, but an interesting one nonetheless. She looks like sweetness tied up in a blue sand bow, and he is the very image of cruelty cursed with the maw of a shark. What's their story? On August 30th, user CloudStrifeSimp posted a peculiar TikTok with Gojo Satoru from Jujutsu Kaisen and Elsa from Disney's Frozen as a couple, captioned with hashtag Gojo Elsa. As is the case of all crack ships, the post was perplexing, the comments section filled with bewilderment as users rightfully pointed out the raw absurdity of this couple. Though I think the truly absurd thing is someone with this username making a remark like that. But honey, I'm with you there. Obviously, there were callbacks to Jack Frost and Elsa, which fair. There was the angst of being two people from different worlds, so pining was their way of keeping their love alive. And of course, they built in aspects of Elsa's struggles with her powers while she's reconciling her budding affections for Gojo, who serves a similar role to Jack Frost as the playful jokester. Although this was clearly made in jest, as were the majority of Cloud Strife Sim's posts, the kindling was set. Gojo Elsa climbed to 1.5 million views. These users were unaware that they stood on the hallowed origins of Shitpo's history, because soon after Cloud Strife Simp would return to the kitchen. Within the same day, another TikTok featuring the characters Ryomen Sukuna and Cinderella was posted, the common thread being another crack ship including characters from Jujutsu Kaisen and Disney. Cinderella is… well the titular character from Disney's 1950 film of the same name. Cinderella, much like in the original French fairy tale Cendrillon, is a beautiful down-to-earth and kind girl who dutifully serves the whims of her cruel stepmother and stepsisters. She is treated less as a family member and more like a slave, dressed in rags that do nothing to hide her beauty. Regardless, she remains hopeful that her future will change, and that opportunity for change arises in the form of the kingdom's ball. Now Sukuna is an orange cat from hell. He's the stinky menace running rampant, stirring shit up like a Michelin chef in the restroom that is Jujutsu Kaisen. Oh Sukuna God. is the king of curses, a title bestowed to the former human turned Jujutsu sorcerer turned curse for his countless atrocities throughout the Heian era, a time of blood and death. Sukuna's reputation as the curse to end all curses persisted well over 1,000 years after his death, his name becoming synonymous with promised destruction. Their post climbed to 3 million views. Now what if I told you they're not the only crack ship? Zuccarella is the second in a long entry of crack ships featuring JJK and Disney characters, also known as JJK Disney, all of which feature the previously mentioned Gojo Elsa, Yuji Rapunzel, Ariel Megami, Tian Anonymi, Tinkerbell and Ghetto, and... Toji and Buzz Lightyear. Each ship comes with a photo set covering the course of their romance, and of course, we looked on in horror. Aside from their introductory posts, we have silly little angst edits beating to the tune of Tumblr angst photo sets, in a way, a meta acknowledgement of their being characters from different worlds a la star-crossed lovers. And you know, it's funny, it's goofy, ha huh? ha, huh? we make the dolls kiss- <laughs> Cloud Strife Simp is the patient zero of chaos and their only hobby is making people regret the gift of literacy and sight. And I live for it. I have been in the deepest depressive rut lately, and their TikToks are the only thing keeping me from ending my subscription to life. Upon analyzing their account, the JJK Disney stuff is par for the course in the crack ship department. However, no one could expect the grip, the chokehold that some silly little joke would have on TikTok. At the time of writing this, each of these crack ships have pulled in millions of views, except you go away. Starting with Gojo Elsa at 15.8 million views, Megami Ariel at 4.2 million views, Nanami Tiana at 24.8 million views, Ghetto Tinkerbell at 4.5 million views, Yuji Rapunzel 1.4 million views, and Sukuna Cinderella at 96.3 million views? Everybody welcome the lovely couple for the first dance as man and wife evidently people love 
and I mean love Sucarella when we compare it to the rest of the JJK Disney ships. You need to understand how weird it is to be scrolling through the JJK tag after the events of Chapter 236, and going from this to this. <laughs> It's cheaper than therapy, understandable. And it turns out we're all in on the joke but in our own way. If we look at the comments section of the post that started it, we'll see that there's an abundance of bewildered people questioning the very existence of Sucarella, much like Gojo Elsa. Aside from those comments, there was a mixture of humorous reactions commenting on the absurdity of such a ship, as is the norm of all crack ships. Some dare to even label the ship as abusive, Cinderella having been a victim of negligence and abuse her entire life. Remember, this is the same character who is the namesake behind a syndrome, whereas Sukuna was a walking trigger warning. Now, all of that I expected, especially because I was in the first group. However, what I never expected was the sheer flood of people who were so keenly, and more importantly, genuinely interested in the ship. What was meant to be a new entry on the list of reasons why anime fans need to touch grass became a source of inspiration for artists and writers alike. But you're probably wondering, what are fans even working with? Why do they like seeing these two people together so much? Honey, take a seat in the ball pit with me and let me give you the rundown. So we know that the beginning of Sucarella's relationship is an almost cat and mouse relationship, predator meets prey type of situation, leaving us with the question of how they even got together in the first place. If we analyze the progression of the images in chronological order, what we can discern is the start of one-sided attraction. Sukuna shows interest in Cinderella, and Cinderella is understandably freaked out by this mystery man who keeps popping up in her life to commit atrocities. Okay, so our tags so far are toxic relationship, crack ship, abuser, abuse, victim, uh, non -com on maybe, dead dub don't open, crossover, forced relationship kidnapping, non-canon compliant, maybe a bit of unrequited horror degradation, and age difference. Does anyone in the class have questions? No? Alright, but oh wait. Cinderella said, no, fuck you, I'ma get that meal ticket, and is spotted canoodling with the prince at the ball. Sukuna's mad that he didn't get an invite, and hits Prince Charming with a domain expansion so hard it prolapses his anus. Not really, his eyes turn green and that's kind of it. The next few TikToks are written in ancient hieroglyphics because somehow Cinderella and Sukuna hooked up, he's holding her hostage, and she dumped him off screen. And this is where I believe we're near a black hole because time is collapsing upon itself. Because now Sukuna grieves for the woman who somehow belonged to him, he held her hostage again. Cinderella marries the man of her dreams, a guy who doesn't feast on mice, and Sukuna escalates to being a petulant menace to cope. He stalks Cinderella and Prince Charming, becoming a whole ass termite infestation upon their relationship. But then there's a bubble of doubt that floats to the surface. Perhaps Sukuna's come to accept the futility of his pursuit when he sees the joy in Cinderella's eyes. But then the seeds of NTR are sown when Cinderella hesitates to cast out Sukuna, falling back into his arms and trapping herself in the cycle of the serpent. Naturally, the shit show evolves into a shit matinee. Sukuna and Cinderella marry, Prince Charming crashes the wedding, and in all his delirium, challenges Sukuna to a duel. I wonder who won? We then find out that they were lovers in a past life. Huh? And they have a son. <gasps> Their son, Badge Magus Ryomen, has his mother's blonde locks and his father's crimson eyes. He's Bakugo. He's legit just Bakugo. I don't know why the fuck his name is Badge Magus. I just got here. Whoever the fuck he is, he's trapped in a loveless family because of course he is. Sukuna operates on impossible difficulty when it comes to being a good husband and father and fails horribly at both which leads to the deterioration of his family. Now he's threatening to tear apart the family by taking possession of the son and using him like a flashlight, much to Cinderella's chagrin, who is helpless to do anything but weep. And that's the story so far. In summation, Sukuna and Cinderella's relationship is a toxic one-sided trophy game closer to a safari hunt than a romantic relationship. And to the fans waiting in the wings, this was the stuff of soap opera myth. There's a moment where the tide started to turn the overwhelming consensus now supportive of the ship. I would say this occurred around the TikTok where Cinderella dumps Sukuna. Of course, there were spectators who acted equally delusional in the comments for the sake of keeping up the joke. But I would argue this is roughly around the time that the majority began to genuinely ship Sukarella. And... The proof is in the abundance of fan content. Once the stage was set, 
fans began to post their interpretations of Sucarella fan comics. Fan edits to audio, memes, cosplay, everything to expand on the ever-growing Sucarella lore. Trust me, it's still legitimately nuts, but there's now a sincere edge to the output of these works. I like to say that the evolution of a meme begins when original art gets involved. The original Sucarella TikToks were these goofy-ass, rude photo edits, but now we have people dedicating their time and energy on original art just for the shits and giggles. Like, look at this! This! Um, do you love me? You do not wish a life with me for yourself. No one wishes George, that. George, I will stand with you between the heavens and the earth. I will tell you where you are. Do you love me? I love you. From the moment, from the moment I saw you trying to go over the wall. Someone made this for fun. There's even this adorable doujin with a reimagined take on Sukuna and Cinderella's meat cute called Chocolate and Vanilla. It's a delicate shoujo-styled romance dripping with charm, the love story of Sukuna and Cinderella decorated with roses and kisses of color, just dripping with this pure, chaste love. But the most interesting take, in my opinion, is Cinderella and Sukuna as longtime friends. It's not so much that he's a stalker or a pushy guy off the street this time, but more of the quiet and aloof best friend who's been in love with Cinderella his entire life. The only thing stopping him from love is himself, but where there is fluff, there is angst. Some creators refuse to be happy and, to be quite frank, take great pleasure in torturing Sukuna. Cinderella takes her life into her own hands and casts Sukuna out of her life. Instead of being strung along by the dangerous allure of Sukuna, Cinderella blossoms into the person she's always wanted to be, while Sukuna is obsessed with what they once were. And if we're not busy being depressed, then we can be a little wholesome and horny. There's a more comical twist on this where Cinderella straight rizzes the audacity out of Sukuna, snatches his wig, throws it into the dryer and leaves him crumpled on the floor. So good. As you've probably gathered, the Sucarella fandom remixes the subtext of the original lore to almost kind of create this new timeline. A great deal of retcon is taken, just like any other, but the tone of this fan art is similar to that of traditional shipping fan art, blurring the lines further. This pushes Sucarella in the direction of a traditional shoujo couple, and it is so interesting to see what people will do to avoid chapter 236. Gojo forever, we are all done. The shocking news of the events of chapter 236 sex, uh, left an impact? so to speak, a product of JJK's increasingly bleak atmosphere. JJK Disney became the exact palate cleanser and distraction that the JJK fandom needed because anything is better than watching your favorite characters get offed one by one. We're all holding hands as we walk into the fires of delusion. The timing couldn't be more perfect. And the allure of pairing up JJK's public enemy number one with one of the sweetest Disney princesses was simply too good to ignore. However, it's easy enough to say that people love this ship because of the ridiculousness of it all, but I think there's a deeper psychological reason at the core. Because of course there is. I want you all to think about the prototypical Hollywood bad boy. You know, James Dean in East of Eden, Marlon Brando in A Streetcar Named Desire. Why do we, namely, heterosexual, cissexual young women, like them so much? Is it their looks, their double may care attitude, their counter-cultural stance on society, the leather, the motorcycles, the thrill of never knowing what to expect? Also known as the all girls want bad boys trope, the bad boy is similar to the baronic hero that we discussed on the Miguel video. They're an outcast, a critic of society as a whole, emotionally troubled, and emotionally unavailable. However, unlike the baronic hero, the bad boy is often unstable, violent, unpredictable, domineering, rude, and incredibly controlling. Now, these negative qualities can be perceived as strong and masculine, therefore desirable to the general standard for masculinity. The expectation, even in our ever-inclusive world, is for men to be the authoritative figure in the relationship as established by this list of stereotypic masculine traits from the changing definition of masculinity by Clyde W. Franklin II. Self-explanatory, but this list includes typical masculine traits, such as objective, hides emotions, aggressive, feelings not easily hurt, self-confident, likes, math and science, not excitable in a minor crisis, to name a few. Evidently, the standard man explored in this text is one who is in full control of their emotions in order to exert as much control as possible over a given situation and even woman. As we know, the extreme of these qualities can lead a man to become a toxic machismo concoction, a man who is incapable of saying no lest his ego wither away. Now, don't get me wrong, there is something attractive about a decisive guy who can make the right call. That's reliable in my book. The thing is, the typical bad boy is not this. Instead, the bad boy makes the woman in the relationship, his emotional janitor, the custodian of his trauma and future transgressions that are a product of their poor upbringing. Sukuna, I'm coming for your unwanted ass shtick, you bitch.
age, and within the scope of fiction, these women are typically considered the good girl type. The curfew-obeying, pastel-wearing, soft-spoken, and wallflower type, the loyal type who stands by the side of their partner in a raging storm. As a result, the couple's dynamic mirrors the stereotypical gender roles of men and women. The women in this relationship are expected to serve as the nurturing figure to the damaged bad boy, healing wounds both physical and emotional. While he's busy raising the town and making a mess of things, she is expected to play the role of the dutiful partner. <laughs> Mm -hmm. The unfortunate reality of the situation is that young women will find themselves in relationships with these types of men, especially short-term relationships. The article, Girls' Perceptions of Boys with Violent Attitudes and Behaviors and of Sexual Attraction, explores the trend of dangerous boys as the preferred sexual partners of adolescent girls ages 13 to 16 years old. To paraphrase the following excerpt, young girls preferred hooking up with the more aggressive boys because they were considered more exciting in comparison to their safer counterparts, i.e calmer and more submissive boys. The text covers the low perception these boys have of the girls they sleep with, displaying no care and learning the names of their partners, effectively treating them as another notch in their belt, for example. But I should point out that this research did yield another interesting revelation, that being how nice boys are preferred for long-term relationships. It brings to mind the TikToks where Cinderella has agency wrestling for control of the steering wheel of her life from Sukuna. He's more like her romp, okay, Chase is more like it, in the sun rather than her spring, autumn, and winter in this timeline. There's a mention of Prince Charming as the better option, the correct option, the rest of Cinderella's seasons because he isn't combative like Sukuna in a way. The persistent appeal of bad boys and by extension the good girl bad boy trope is tethered to the audience's fascination with the unpredictable and sweeping possibilities of said romance. It's why characters like Loki from the MCU, Dobby from My Hero Academia, or Muzan from Demon Slayer, just to name a few off the top of my head, are so well liked. It's that resounding disrespect for the system, the pedestal they placed themselves upon, and the aura. The aura's important. Some people just want to be used like a footrest, and I mean, can't relate, but I hope the view is great from down there. It's why I believe so many people ended up loving the Sukarella ship not just because it's goofy and just really funny, but it's the fact that it plays with a tried and true formula that's great for remixing. To the uninformed, Sukuna is one of the most defining villains of this generation of anime, and of course, this comes with a lot of admirers. Jump on his TikTok hashtag or Tumblr hashtag, and you might drown in the sheer amount of sodden panties people keep flinging at him. And you know what, our brethren across the pond also deserve their flowers too, because no fandom is complete without that one Japanese fan artist who is supplying the entire market for that single character. Christmas came a little early for me this year. What you're looking at is 60 pounds of penis and balls. There's more wiener there than your mind can even comprehend. So honestly, seeing him paired up with another character will lead to some gears turning. And personally, I love the JJK Disney stuff, except how much do I love it? Are you ready for a jump scare? You were a wonderful experience. You were... everything. I've been keeping up with JJK since the anime debut, then I read the manga, and I'm just now getting into the fandom. You guys are some of the most unhinged creatures, and I want to examine you under a microscope. But I won't give anyone shit for making gold when they're in the middle of grieving, because the rise of Sukarella just so happened to coincide with the release of chapter 236, which, again, we won't delve into. It could be a coincidence, but the recent shitstorm in JJK has kind of covered the fandom in a miasma of dread, and JJK fans will give anything to see the sun if that means taking a peek into the inner machinations of Cloud Strife Simp's mind. I'm for it. Personally, I fuck with Nanami Tiana. It just makes the most sense even though this random woman is canoodling with my husband. She's a hard-working businesswoman with dreams to run her own restaurant, and he's a kind foodie with marriage on the mind. It's simply meant to be. Their TikToks are also really cute. There's this one where a person made a big doja hover and it's the only thing keeping me from torching this app. I'll just be consumed by jealousy instead because I don't care that it happened to Tiana. It should have been me. Megumi Ariel is a close second. He's my boy and he's a perfect stand-in for Eric with that white dress shirt fit he got going on. It's the close embrace, the side profile, the initial look of utter disinterest followed by a look of concern. Plus Megumi's a Disney prince. No, I will not be taking any criticism. Yuji Rapunzel was a really obvious choice and I'm so mad that I didn't come up with it first. Rapunzel's my Disney princess, so only the best for my girl. Eugene Fitzherbert be damned. Gojo Elsa. Corporate needs you to find the differences between this picture and this picture. 
We had this with Jack Frost, what is the point? I ain't even gonna touch Getho and Tinkerbell because that's between them and God. So yeah, laugh all you want, but I think JJK Disney is just a great example of what happens when a cult, I mean community, finds a common interest that lights the flame in their bellies. And let's be real, this wouldn't be a Vivi with a V video essay unless I broke down their character designs too. And for once, I'm going to say that their character designs don't really have elements that would jive with each other. Let me explain. One of the main elements of their design, for example, that wouldn't jive with each other is the fact that they come from distinctly different periods of time. Which is one of the main reasons why this is even a crack ship to begin with, because one of the main reasons why we can tell if something is a crack ship is the fact that the aesthetics don't jive with each other. I see their distinctive and completely different art styles as being another sign that they're from different worlds. For example, Sukuna is obviously based off of the older elements of Japanese aesthetics, specifically from the Heian era. My man is over here rocking a custom fitted kimono, woman's kimono to be exact, because he needs enough room for all four of his arms. And for the uninformed and non-red-pilled, Sukuna used to have four arms in his original form, which is the exact reason why his kimono happens to have wider sleeves in comparison to a traditional kimono for men. Unlike a woman's kimono, which would feature the obi knotted at the waist with a more hourglass figure, Sukuna's kimono takes on the traditional straight and rectangular shape of the average men's kimono, devoid of any waist definition. The silhouette is looser and more relaxed, reflecting a more casual and understated aesthetic. Sukuna's color palette also follows this trend as well. Instead of wearing vibrant colors with intricate patterns like a woman's kimono would, Sukuna has more of a monochromatic color palette consisting of navy blue, white, and touches of gray and black. His facial and body tattoos also give him a bit of a dangerous edge, tapering off into these razor sharp edges. The tattoos running along his jawline almost taking on the appearance of bared fangs like that of a snake. The pop of pink coming from Yuji's hair gives him a little bit of an unserious touch, however. Manda's so unserious, I cannot look at this fool and take him seriously when he's wearing fucking slippers with socks. I would like to apologize to my viewers and most importantly the entire country of Japan. I know what these are called, but this is Sukuna. <laughs> Back to the video. Now let's look at Cinderella. Obviously Cinderella's aesthetic borrows a lot of inspiration from the pseudo-Disney French society that she resides in. And of course there's some residual influence from the 1950s era that Cinderella was made in. Now I should preface that this comes from some loose research that I've done on Cinderella, but this is basically what my research has yielded me. 1950s Cinderella is like a love letter to French haute couture, specifically to the works of Christian Dior and Elsa Schiaparelli, both of whom were very prolific fashion designers during the 1950s. Now while Dior liked to play around with the shape language of the woman's figure, thus conveying an hourglass shape, Schiaparelli liked to play around more with bouffant and extremely feminine and more overtly bright colors, which is an interesting back and forth that we actually do see Cinderella engage in with her pink dress and the white ball gown that she ends up wearing to the ball. Now the iconic ball gown is obviously inspired by Dior's fashion, especially with the overt hourglass shapes as well as the puffy sleeves. And on top of that, Cinderella accessorizes her gown with a pair of white gloves, a black choker and a headband that's connected to some pearl earrings and a French twist. And because Cinderella is the epitome of conventional beauty, that being a Caucasian woman with strawberry blonde hair, deep black lashes, and beautiful blue eyes and red lips, she then becomes the image of iconic feminine beauty once she is transformed into the Disney princess that she always has been. And this feminine yet delicate shape language is something that is maintained throughout the entirety of Cinderella's design. Whereas Sukuna is made up of these dangerous jagged edges which are supposed to reflect his curse technique, Cinderella looks much more soft and non-threatening, kind of like the petals of a flower. And because blue and white are two colors that are associated with innocence, purity, and serenity, it paints Cinderella as almost this matronly or Virgin Mary type of figure. Whereas in comparison, Sukuna's red, a color that's always associated with lust, passion, and violence, paints himself as this rabid dog that cannot be leashed nor tamed. And yet, even though everything about their character design and their writing seems to be conflicting, we have to think back to the good girl, bad boy trope. The opposing elements at odds are exactly what create the fodder necessary in order to lean into the lunacy of the crack ship. And this is absolutely the reason why every JJK fan and every other poor soul who was in immediate vicinity of this ship was so enamored, or maybe awestruck, by the existence of this ship. And if humans have proven anything, it's the fact that we love to enjoy things as a community as much as we like to say that we're free thinkers. And I believe this is the reason why Sucarella has become TikTok's new favorite ship. I never want to look at the Sukurella tag ever again. I am tired. I am withered. I am exhausted. And yet even though I lay here absolutely comatose, I'm grinning ear to ear. It makes me so...
giddy and light to see people be this unapologetically excited over a couple of made-up people, a handful of lines and colors. It's... it's fun here. I'm sorry to do this every time I end a video, but I'm tired. So, so tired. And I really hope you enjoyed the video. If you're still here, that is. And if you are, thank you. I've been sitting by myself in the dark a lot lately, afraid to go out and speak to other people, do anything, really. I think I'm at that point in my mental health where I'm on the edge of a deep decline into a pit. Every part of my body is filled with lead, and I'm wading through a pool in the dark, essentially. I... I just desperately want to create things that people can find joy in, because that is my ethos as a creator and an artist. I'm pulling apart pieces of myself to put on display in this online museum, and you guys have been so gracious with your comments, your shares, showing up to my P3 live streams, God rest its soul, and just giving my stuff the time of day. I get really wrapped up in my own mind sometimes, but I love doing this type of analysis. I really believe that fandom isn't something to scoff at when it brings people this much joy, taking joy just from creating and sharing. I think it's wonderful, really. So, if you like my stuff, be sure to like, subscribe, share, and let me know what your favorite JJK Disney ship is. Do you have one, or are you finding out about this now for the first time? And if so, how far back have I set you on therapy? Let me know. I've been me, Vicky, and that's it. See you.